Our episode kicks off with a flashback of Gordo and his wife Tracy back when they first met, when she was hoping to learn to fly and he was hoping she'd do something involving his fly. Sounds like a good plan. Start a little speed. Uh huh. They push down. Push down on the wheel. We'll go, we'll go a little bit, little, little Is this little what's faster. called a stone? That, that's it. Down. Assuming, of course, they survive. Actually, it looks like she was just screwing with him. She's got hundreds and hundreds of hours of flying experience. This is just a very expensive, carbon unfriendly way to flirt. After the titles, the topic is Anastasia, first woman on the moon, and the completely gobsmacked NASA leadership that was unprepared for the Soviets going for that record, too. And probably not even thinking that it was a record. Why not put a woman on the moon? But there's nothing to iron up there. No, they're still working on the lunar military base, and the idea is to take what would have been Skylab, make some serious modifications, and instead create a moon habitat. And there will be further expansions that can include military aspects. What exactly are the um, Pentagon's plans in that regard? Yeah, this is a very salient question. A lot of problems happen because the military is given a list of objectives, so they work to try to meet those objectives, only no one really thought them through. Korean War, Vietnam War, they were messes in part because instead of asking, what is the vision of this for when it's all over? What are we hoping we'll be able to look back and see that we accomplished? No, we don't think in those terms, and so all of a sudden everyone is surprised that telling 100,000 troops to just stay where they are and do nothing is not having the outcome we'd hoped for. Well, ditto this lunar base. What is your vision? What is the outcome of having a lunar base for military forces? To make sure the Ruskies don't take the nice rocks? Because otherwise they might draw a giant hammer and sickle on it? Because if you don't know, then your objective, put military forces on the moon, because, seems like the worst waste of tax money since, well, okay, the last use of tax money, but my point still stands. Putting a base on the moon just to say that you have one is the military version of the gym membership that never gets used. Gene Kranz explains it's going to take two years to put the moon lab on the moon. Apparently, he doesn't get what the purpose of this moon base is. It's to exist. He's so focused on the unimportant details like having a practical place for it to be and making sure it'd be safe for it to be there. That completely irritates people who have apparently risen to the level of supervillain because they want to be able to say, I own a moon base. Really, that's all it's useful for is trapping James Bond or having a chance to pop over to Area 51 and brag about it to Gorblatt. They sure would be jealous, wouldn't they? So the head of NASA pops in to say that the president wants America to put a woman on the moon now that the Soviets have, which is a problem since the closest they have to women astronauts is that time Gordo got drunk and shoved two balloons in his shirt. Deke explains this is also going to take time. Like the landing thing, it's not about, oh yeah, how hard can it be? It actually is incredibly difficult to make someone into an astronaut. It's more than just putting them in a spacesuit and telling them not to touch anything. The same way not knowing how to land and crashing would be a horrible, easily foreseen, program-destroying tragedy, putting someone, no matter what their sex is, who hasn't been completely and thoroughly prepped for the totality of all that it is to be an astronaut, is very likely going to end in miserable failure. Deke Slayton here can attest to the high criteria of being an astronaut, because the reason he's in this office and not riding rockets is that despite being so qualified he was one of the Mercury 7, even he couldn't go into space. The issue isn't whether or not a woman could be an astronaut. It's how long it's going to take for her to be prepared physically, mentally, and intellectually to do that job. So they turn to the Mercury 13. It's not a NASA project, but nevertheless, it was an actual event to have 13 women be put through the same kind of physical training as the Mercury 7. Of them, two are still flying, the super-qualified Molly Cobb and Patty Doyle, second in her class. There's also Danielle, who is an experienced pilot, is an engineer, works at NASA, and she would be the first black person, male or female, to be in space, giving America a first in the space race, finally. And 
there's a suggestion by the press secretary, Tracy, Gordo's wife. She jumps at the chance, much to Gordo's disbelief, but he rallies quickly. It's you. You're going to be an astronaut candidate. No. I'm going to be an astronaut. Wish I had her confidence. She's convinced she has the right stuff. I'd settle for just having stuff. Karen is having the exact opposite reaction of what you might expect. She's pissed. She presumes they're going to be let in with lowered standards and diminish the enormity of what Ed had to achieve and what they've all sacrificed for. A couple of them are supposed to be pretty good pilots. But you're probably right. Yeah. Of, course, of course you're right. You're 100% right. But I w Got to be kidding me. I'm sorry. I should have said women belong in the kitchen, honey. I'm sorry I was so insensitive. So the big day happens and Deke comes in to make clear this is going to be a rigorous experience with grading on things from the physical to the intellectual to the psychological to the, well, can you play nice with others? That sounds like psychological, but in astronaut terms, that's for can you spend a week trapped in an enclosed space with two other people without showering and not kill yourself or others? Let's face it, the names Molly Cobb and Patty Doyle both sound like those that you'd hear died exchanging fire with the police, so that is not outside the realm of possibility. We join them as they're working on flying jets, some for the very first time like Tracy. But with Ed in the back seat to advise her, she pulls it off with flying colors and makes it through the first cut. She makes sure to tell that to Karen, too, who's babysitting for her, really emphasizing how much she loves having him right behind her, just right back there with her hands firmly on the stick, moving it every way he tells her that she should. Almost sexual, isn't it, Smithers? Even Margot is involved, talking about a life-or-death situation, re-entry. When I explained about the command service module sometimes being called the command module, it's true that it sometimes would be used for simplicity. But technically, the command module is just the cone-shaped front part of it. What happens is, when they get back to Earth, they separate the command module from the service module, leave that behind, and the command module brings the astronauts and whatever they brought with them back safely. And Mark was explaining how crucial everything is. In reality, Apollo 12's return was so rocky, a camera came loose and hit Alan Bean in the head so hard he was briefly knocked senseless. Still, if you send an astronaut named Mr. Bean up into space, that kind of thing is expected to happen. After Molly Ace is the theory of this, she's even farting around with a crossword during class, she knows it so well, we see that the list has been whittled down to 12, and Tracy is still on it. Bottom of the list, but do you know what they call the person who finishes at the bottom of one of those lists? Astronaut. Or as I mostly just called an ass. Molly and Patty seem to have their own private clique, while some of the other women discuss their experiences with various kinds of aircraft. I mean, flying just didn't seem like an option as a career, you know? I get that. You don't really know what is actually possible to become your life because existence isn't the simple blocks that we are all taught it was in school and, and that TV says that it is. I mean, hell, not one of my teachers in high school would have guessed what it is that I do now. Okay, well, I suppose Mr. Bakken, when he said I was going to be a professional dipshit, but I think he was being sarcastic. They spend some time simulating the aforementioned re-entry. Tracy's in the command seat with Molly and Danielle backing her up. Although Molly has to do a lot of kibitzing for Tracy, and even then they burn up when the guidance computer fails. Molly is not kind, although not wrong either, when she notes that Tracy can fly and is married to an astronaut, but does not have the technical background that the rest of them do. This makes Tracy look at everything differently, realizing that she should have been cut already and that it's only politics, the pretty blonde pilot wife of an astronaut, that has kept her in it. This leads to a fight with Gordo, which leads to her telling him to leave and him going. And I won't even suggest what he's going to do, because by now, even my cat is looking at me going, get a load of this guy. Meanwhile, as part of our efforts to be a National Aeronautic and Space Administration, we found some interesting results from a lunar satellite, the possibility of ice. It's no guarantee, 
But if it is water, then it's a game changer. It not only will provide water for the humans and plants on the habitat, but it can also be turned into rocket fuel. And mixers, assuming that Gordo's up there. Meanwhile, the astronaut cadets are about to get into something unexpected. Desert survival training. This is vital because you could have a crash landing and need to know how to survive in an extreme environment, and will also ready you should you wind up on that damn planet of the apes. They're dropped into the desert with a walkie-talkie for if they need rescue, but use of it will result in a failure, which is an option in this case, although one that will get you kicked out of the program. They have to carry 40 pounds of gear to their destination and without a map. Not going to be easy. The desert is not kind to idiots. Patty's first and Molly is second, but having a bad day is Ellen, who has sprained her ankle badly. Tracy finds her and works on some first aid, and then makes them some coverings to protect them from the sun. Together they make it back, although Deke points out it was explicitly stated this was not a team exercise. Still, both are part of the final eight in the program. However, Deke takes Tracy aside. He actually, in private, commends her for her willingness to do that. But his concern is that in the parts to come, it's not in her skill set. And they're starting to get into things beyond walkie-talkies and a blinking light to indicate failure. We're getting into the areas where mistakes could lead to actual death. He asks her to withdraw, but she doesn't want to give up on this. So that means we're on to the LEM simulator, the flying bedstead. And as the show notes, Neil Armstrong himself was training for Apollo 11 on this thing when he was nearly killed. And Tracy's up first. So what's the worst that can happen? Okay, let's not jump to conclusions. It could be NASA saying they haven't decided on a new Pope yet. Gordo arrives assuming the worst, but it was actually Patty Doyle who crashed. Let's hope that she takes this as him just in general always being worried about her and not the, well, obviously when I saw a fireball, I assumed it was you. Who else would be so incompetent? But what does this mean for the program? Let's go on to episode four.